that's a question that people would ask normally in everyday um, interactions. But in this day and age, who are you is becoming more serious because in the past people have stolen lots of stuff. Today we have a problem of stealing identity. Identity theft. So maybe you are not you and you have to prove that you are you if you want to be you to do something that you want to do, which is not very fun. And you heard horror stories about people paying lots of money to prove that I am I'm me. Now, this is part of the technology that we are living with and the age that we are living at. And uh, nobody would be better to talk about this other than Dr. Axton Betts Hamilton. And uh, before I say that, I would like to say welcome to Revolutions in Science and Technology Symposium. Uh, this is the first Eastern Illinois University Symposium on Science and Technology, as far as I know. And Dr. Stephen Daniels and I worked on putting this together with a hundred uh, people from all campus, cross campus, off campus, to make this thing happen. We have over 50 speakers. And uh, we wish that this wouldn't be the last, but the start so that uh, we would have the 50th, after 50 years, uh, when you come for homecoming, bring your grandchildren and say, hey, I was in the first one. So, without much ado, please join me in welcoming Dr. Axel. Well, good morning, everyone, and thank you for coming. Today, I'm going to talk to you about how identity theft really is a problem and how we as a society have changed our perspective on how we view identity theft over the past 20 years. And so, I have I guess a two-pronged expertise on identity theft. I not only have a professional background with identity theft as a professor, but I also have a personal background. And my personal background is that I was a victim of identity theft 20 years ago, back in 1993 when I was in the fifth grade. And my parents were victims of identity theft as well. So in my experience and in my parents' experience, Overall, our attempts to remedy the negative effects of identity theft on our own lives were unsuccessful for a variety of reasons, and I'm sure you'll be able to pick up on some of those as the presentation goes along. So again, I have a professional background with identity theft. A couple of research projects that I've completed. Um, one, I've looked at the consumer perceptions of identity theft. So asking people do they perceive identity theft as a problem, if they perceive it as a problem, where do they perceive it as a problem, and do they perceive themselves to be at risk for becoming victims of identity theft. I also most recently completed a research project looking at the experiences of adult child identity theft victims, and I'll define who adult child identity theft victims are in a few minutes. And I give talks like this one quite a bit. I give talks um, nationally as well as at a state level. So for those of you who might not be familiar, familiar as I am or as my students are after taking my class about the different types of identity theft, there are five main types of identity theft. The first type is financial identity theft. And this is what most people think of when they think of identity theft. And financial identity theft often involves someone stealing the personal information of another in order to either gain access to a victim's existing financial accounts or to establish new accounts in the victim's name. Medical identity theft is a popular form of identity theft these days. And it typically involves someone stealing <laughs> the personal information of another, in, including their health insurance information, in order to obtain doctor's office visits, medical procedures, prescriptions, and the like, under the victim's name. Character identity theft is the oldest form of identity theft, and the best example I have of character identity theft is when someone 
is, let's say they're, they're pulled over to the side of the road, the police officer gets them out of their car, and um, you know, they're gonna be under arrest. The officer says, you know, well, what's your name? And they give someone else's name, someone else's address, someone else's, you know, any other personal information about someone else so they can avoid an arrest record in their name. The arrest record then goes under the victim's name. Familial identity theft simply is a family member stealing the identity of another. And there are some cases of child identity theft that are also familial identity theft. In fact, many of those cases are because parents are often the perpetrators of child identity theft. So child identity theft, there are two categories. There's child identity theft, which is where an individual under the age of 18 has their identity stolen, but that crime is discovered before the child turns 18. And when the crime is discovered before the child turns 18, the parent or guardian is usually saddled with the responsibility of remedying the negative effects associated with the theft of that child's identity. Adult child identity theft, which is what I focus my most re recent research on, is again when someone under the age of 18 has their identity stolen, but that theft is not discovered until that child is 18 or older. And since that child is then 18 or older, the responsibility of remedying any negative effects as a result of the identity theft falls upon the victim. And by that point, usually their identity has been used for any number of years, their credit's tarnished, their employment record might be tarnished, their driving record might be tarnished, depending on what the identity thief did with their identity. So as I said in this presentation, I'm gonna to talk to you about how identity theft has changed over the past 20 years in terms of how we see it in our society. So I want you to go back to 1993. I realize some of you probably weren't born yet, but for those of you who were, Jurassic Park, the movie, was popular. In fact, it was so popular, it was used as a supplement in my fifth grade science class to teach us about dinosaurs. So think Jurassic Park. Think about slap bracelets. And for those of you who aren't familiar with slap bracelets, they, they look like rulers. And you know, they were usually brightly colored, had designs on them. And then kids loved these things. Oh, I had several of them as a kid. And you take what looks like a ruler, you slap it on your wrist, and then it forms to your wrist. So it's a bracelet. So those were very popular in 1993. In terms of fashion, bib overalls were very popular. And it wasn't cool to wear both straps hooked in the front. The best way to wear overalls in 1993, you know, if you were a kid, was only to have one strap hooked and the other one flopping around behind your back. If you did that, you were styling. <laughs> Gas on average was $1.16 a gallon and a postage stamp was 29 cents. So again, take yourself back to 1993. And you know, at the time that Jurassic Park was popular, at the time that gas was $1.16 a gallon on average, and at the time kids were sporting overalls with one strap unhooked, the world didn't know anything about identity theft. And so because of that, Law enforcement tended to view identity theft as a minimal crime. It's not a big deal, Nobody, you know, nobody's getting physically hurt. And part of the reason why law enforcement didn't view identity theft as a serious crime was because the way the laws were written at that time, consumers weren't victims of identity theft. So even if, a, even if your personal information back in 1993, was used, you know, so someone else could establish credit in your name, you're not the victim. You aren't seen as, as being hurt. The credit grantors were the ones seen as being hurt. They were the ones being defrauded in the eyes of the law. So if you were a victim of identity theft in 1993, and you went to your local police, state police, whatever, <coughs> explained what had happened, they would tell you, you know, there's no laws 
against this. There's nothing. There's no laws that protect you. We can't even really take a police report because you're not a victim. So sorry, you've got to live with it. And this mentality was very pervasive across the country, and it still is to some degree, but very pervasive until 1998, when the Identity Theft and Assumption Deterrence Act was passed. And this was the first law at the federal level that made consumers a victim of identity theft. And also with this law, um, the Federal Trade Commission was named as the central agency in the United States for handling uh, reports of identity theft, reports of uh, credit reporting agencies not being responsive to identity theft victims. Because as an identity theft victim, if you have a police report and other documentation that shows that an account on your credit report, is, it, it's not yours. It's, it's a case of identity theft. If you provide that information to a credit reporting agency, they're supposed to remove entries associated with that account, whether it be the original account that's been reported to your credit report or the collection agency accounts. And many times this wasn't happening. So that was a provision that was made explicit in this law. Also, the Federal Trade Commission was charged with the task of uh, creating resources not only for victims of identity theft, but for the general public as well. So if you do some internet searching, some of the earliest resources that you find on identity theft are from the Federal Trade Commission, as well as the Identity Theft Resource Center, which was also ironically established in 1998. And they have a victim's assistance helpline. So if you are a victim and you call the Identity Theft Resource Center, there is someone there to, to listen to you, to listen to your case, to listen to your frustrations, to offer uh, resources to you that are, you know, at a not only a national level but specific to your state, and they also offer fact sheets for victims as well as the general public. And the Identity Theft Resource Center, they're based in San Diego, and they were founded by an identity theft victim and their spouse. And the reason the two of them founded this agency was because of the lack of response that they were receiving with remedying the negative effects of identity theft in their own personal situation. <coughs> so moving on to the early 2000s in identity theft, the Fair and Accurate Credit Transactions Act was enacted in 2003. This established annualcreditreport.com I hope at least two-thirds of you in the room know what that is by now, students. So annualcreditreport.com allows consumers one copy of each of their three credit reports once a year, totally for free. So the three credit bureaus are Equifax, Experian, and TransUnion. And this is the only site that you can go to that you can really get your credit reports 100% for free. Not freecreditreport.com, not freecreditreport.us, and all those other websites that have, you know, creeped up out there. Annualcreditreport.com is the one that is legitimate. The Fair and Accurate Credit Transactions Act also um, created the provision for, um, for identity theft victims to place fraud alerts on each of their credit reports. And so what this did is that if you were a victim of identity theft, you can contact each of the credit bureaus and say, I've been a victim of identity theft. You know, I, I, I need to put this fraud alert on my credit report. That way, if the thief applies for more credit in my, tries to apply for more credit in my name, the potential credit grantors have that information on my credit report that says, hey, wait a minute, you need to do some more double checking because someone's been using my personal information for identity. <coughs> the Fair and Accurate Credit Transactions Act of 2003 also required businesses to truncate 
debit and credit card numbers. So prior to 2003, it's likely that whenever you swiped your debit card or your credit card with a point of transaction sale, you know, standing in the checkout line at Walmart, Target, wherever, it's likely that at the bottom of the receipt, all the numbers of your credit card and debit card were right there. But what do most people do with their receipts? They crumple them up, you know, they throw them on the floorboard of the car, they crumple them up, throw them in the trash, they don't shred them. And so an identity thief could easily get that information. So the Fair and Accurate Credit Transactions Act specified that businesses cannot print more than five numbers of a debit card or credit card number on a receipt. And so you, you should see on your debit card and credit or your receipts where you swiped your debit card or your credit card, you'll see a series of X's and then usually the, it's usually the last four digits of your credit card or debit card number. Also in the early 2000s, identity theft is becoming more widespread in part as a result of the internet. So a lot of identity theft is, is occurring via the internet, and because of that, identity theft doesn't happen just locally anymore. It's not people digging through your trash and getting personal information from documents you haven't shredded, which still happens, but with the internet, the person who stole your identity could be in Russia, for example. So with identity theft, there's all sorts of legal jurisdictional issues as a result of um, the internet and how uh, technology has played a role in how identity theft crimes are now committed. And as a result of technology becoming so widespread and changing so much and it making it difficult for thieves to get caught, the risk of being caught is so minimal compared to the rewards that you could get from committing identity theft that people do it because they, they think, well, you know, the chances of me getting caught, they're very, very, very slim. So I don't have to worry about it. So in the early 2000s, now keep in mind, identity theft as we know it today, according to some authors, has been around since the 1950s. Now, interestingly, you know, you know, you know, family and consumer sciences, consumer <coughs> economics has been around since the early 1900s. Identity theft, as we know it today, has been occurring since the 1950s in various forms. But as a profession, we don't start to research it until the early 2000s. So in terms of research, we are way behind. We've got all this data back here of people committing these crimes. We've got, you know, all of these you know, previous victims, you know, that could serve as wonderful resources for um, future research, but we're just now starting to do it. So the first article in consumer-oriented literature specific to identity theft wasn't published until 2003. Also, with the influence of the media, um, identity theft started becoming more of a buzzword in, in households and in society because the media started picking up on all of these horror stories of identity theft. So, so more media attention, we're starting to get more research in the early 2000s. So moving on to the mid-2000s, again because of all of these media stories and all this hype about how damaging identity theft can be to victims, identity theft protection services and insurance started coming on the market. And the early forms of these products tended to overpromise what they could deliver and they tended to be reactive. So they didn't do anything for the consumer until identity theft happened. For example, some identity theft insurance policies offer reimbursement for expenses, but they were very specific about the expenses that were qualified. So if you sent something certified mail, related to the identity theft. They would reimburse you the $4.05, for example. So it wasn't, wasn't a lot of help in most cases. And how many of you remember the LifeLock commercials where the CEO would, would put his social security number on the side of moving vans and drive around New York City and, and say that, you know, our product is so good that, you know, no one will steal my identity? Anybody remember those? 
How many times do you think his identity was stolen as a result of that? One article I read said 32 times. So, early LifeLock product obviously didn't work too well. The CEO got his identity stolen dozens of times. So, in the mid-2000s also, the awareness of child identity theft is growing. Instead of no law enforcement response, there's a lackluster law enforcement response. So law enforcement realizes they have to take reports from victims, but in terms of follow through, because it's, it's from a law enforcement perspective, it takes a lot of resources to pursue a case of identity theft, and a lot of times they're just not caught. So yes, they take the reports, are they going to go out and find your identity thief for you? Probably not. And in popular press we're in the mid-2000s, we're starting to see books. You know, on Amazon.com, one of the things I noticed is it, you know, it was a small list in the mid-2000s, and now it's grown quite exponentially. You know, there's books out there about how to safeguard your identity, about how to go completely off the grid in terms of personal information. So there's more attention in the popular press at this point. And then the late 2000s up to today, there's an increase in awareness of medical identity theft. There's an interest in foster care youth who have been victimized from a public policy perspective at a state level. There are states on the East Coast, Rhode Island is one of them, that has enacted legislation specific to foster care youth and making sure that if they've been victims of identity theft, they get the resources they need starting at 16 years of age in order to uh, clean up their credit reports. It doesn't uh, help necessarily with other aspects of identity theft, but it does focus on financial identity theft. There's more of a research interest in perpetrators. We're starting to understand as a, as a society and as academics how people perceive identity theft how they protect themselves, and how it impacts victims, but we still don't understand really why people commit these crimes. And so there's some recent research on that, in fact, just published this year. There's more awareness of victim effects due to media stories as well as research. And not only are there financial effects of identity theft, there are emotional effects and physical effects as well. Data breaches are on the rise and they're being tracked as a result of the Privacy Rights Clearinghouse. If you go to privacyrights.org, you can, there's a list of all of the data breaches that had identity theft. So there, I, I just I saw a new story on this last night. So, you know, smartphones, be careful about, about uh, protecting them. Make sure you have them screen locked. Make sure you have um, apps that will wipe your your phone clean of information in case you do lose your smartphone because smartphones are a very popular source of information now for identity thieves in part because they can get away with it and also in part because as a society we haven't gotten to the point where we're fully educating consumers on the benefits as well as potential pitfalls of using smartphones. So in sum, in 20 years We've increased public awareness of identity theft. We've realized it affects people negatively. We've empowered consumers with information and tools like annualcreditreport.com and Federal Trade Commission fact sheets. We still need to encourage law enforcement to be responsive to identity theft cases because, again, the person who's going through it, they're in crisis. They need law enforcement officers that understand that. We need to develop high-tech ways to deter identity thieves, and we need to continue public education efforts and outreach. And with that, what questions do you have? I have 20 questions. Okay. <laughs> but I'll leave the, uh, the opportunity for others. Any questions from the floor? To about your research, do you feel that identity theft is like a domino effect? Like someone before you steal their identity, so now they feel like they put it in a setback, so they steal somebody else's identity? Or do you think it's just like people just want to steal other people's identity? There's no evidence to the first part of your question. Um, it's, it's, 
it's kind of like you're, you're saying someone did something bad and that effect rolls downhill so they do something bad to somebody else. It's just, you know, people want to. And, the re and the, some of the research that exists out there says people steal identities because they want the money. That, that is the number one reason. It's greed. Is it a kick or, I mean, somebody feels good that he did, I, I'm able to do this? Right, and um, there's one identity thief um, that stole so many identities that in 2006, as part of his restitution, he published a book on how he stole identities and why. His name is Glenn Hastings, and that's exactly why he did it. Because it was fun, he knew he could get away with it, he got a good laugh out of it. And by getting a good laugh out of it and getting away with it, he stole enough identities that he had an office in the Sears Tower, it was then called the Sears Tower, in Chicago called IDT. That was the name of his business. That was what was on, on the door. IDT stood for identity theft. So his, his business was IDT Incorporated. No one but him knew it was Identity Theft Incorporated. Another question. And not so much a question, but a comment that this made me think about. In the late 80s when I was in college, I remember having my social security number printed on my checks. Yes. And driver's license number and things like that printed on the checks that we used mm -hmm. and just how much has changed in a short period of time. Yeah, yeah, you definitely don't want to do that anymore. <laughs> what is the penalty range of identity thiever? I mean, uh, thieves, I mean, ranging from what to what? Well, it, it, depends on how much they steal and who they steal it from, and it also varies by state. So many times with the first offense of identity theft, if the person is convicted, they get a fine, which I have always believed in my cynical nature, given that I've been a victim of identity theft. If first offense identity thieves, when they're, when they're required to pay a fine, they probably paid it with money they stole as part of the identity theft. <laughs> so in, there, in some states there are um, laws that specify something called aggravated identity theft, which aggravated identity theft is when you steal the identity of a vulnerable person. So someone who's disabled, an, an elderly person, et cetera. And if you're convicted of aggravated identity theft, you could have fines plus jail time, so on and so forth. So it just depends and it does vary by state. But there is no, no rule or no idea that whoever does this is evil. So you don't punish a big punishment because the fact that you did that, regardless of what you won out of it or got out of it, $10, $100, mm -hmm. it is the fact that you did something that you shouldn't do. You crossed a line. Right. And so you know, our legal system and our public policy doesn't see identity theft as that way. Um, and in part because we don't understand as a society the effects on victims, which is why we need more research on how identity theft affects victims. How about for out of the country steal our identity? There's no punishment for them. No. No. And, and they they're very often times not even caught. And so become more and more our identity stuff from outside the country, thieves, is that right? Yes, yeah, so um, usually if an uh, identity theft ring, and usually in cases of um, international identity theft, it, it's organized crime, and they're operating in rings. In order for um, prosecution to occur, it usually has to come from the uh, thief's home country. So as uh, the United States, we typically can't do a lot about that. Thanks. Yeah, I find it interesting that both you and your parents uh, had identity, identity theft 20 years ago. Mm -hmm. uh, tell us a little bit about how that happened. Well, my <laughs> students know this. Um, I believed for 20 years, because that's what I was told, that my parents' identities were stolen, along with mine. And one of my burning questions in life, and the reason I'm a professor, is because I wanted to know who did it. I always told my parents, someday there will, there will be enough information, enough understanding, that I'll find who did it. And I, I said, I don't care if it takes me the rest of my life. My mom died in February, and February 12th. And on February 25th, my dad called me. 
he said, what were you doing running a credit card over a limit back in 2001? I said, what are you talking about? And Dad says, I have the statement right here. It's your name on it, and you ran it over a limit. And I said, what, what credit card is it? And he, and he tells me, and I said, well, Dad, that was one of the, the credit cards that was taken out as part of the identity theft. And he told me the date on the statement, and it was before I knew I was a victim of identity theft. And I asked my mom if she'd received any statements on these credit cards. She told me no. And this particular credit card um, was a partnership arrangement between her employer, she worked for a financial institution, and the credit card company. So my mom's company logo was printed right on the credit card. So that was the first piece of evidence that demonstrated that she was the person who stole my identity. In that particular case where she took out a credit card through her employer in my name, not only did she steal my identity, she likely made a commission from, you know, taking out the credit card, you know, from her own office. She was a stockbroker. So she stole my identity. Who was she? A commission on who is she? My mom. Uh, she, she stole your... Yeah, my mom was ultimately the one who stole my identity and my dad's identity. And so her identity had never actually been stolen. So it took me 20 years to figure that out. <laughs> That's quite a story. Mm -hmm. Well, uh, I think we will uh, need to um, greet our speaker, please. Mm -hmm.